Okay, so yes, thanks everyone for, for joining today. Um, so I am going to introduce Site. Uh, I'll first introduce myself and then I'll walk through kind of the various features and benefits of how Site can help you do better research. Um, and as I mentioned, I would love to have, you know, any questions, feedback, uh, comments throughout. And so if you have a question immediately, feel free to unmute yourself and, and interrupt, um, or you can wait till the end and I can take all of them at once, really whatever you guys prefer. Um, so my name is Josh Nicholson. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Site. Uh, I have a background in cell biology. I finished a PhD about five years ago uh, from Virginia Tech here in the US. I'm now based in New York. Uh, the idea behind Site really borrows from my experience as a researcher um, in that you know, I knew within my field perhaps what had been tested and shown to be right or wrong and, and what had not been. But if I left my immediate field, I wouldn't have this kind of insider information and I'd be forced to rely upon uh, kind of all the proxies of, of quality. Where is it published? Who are the authors? And then some, some metrics. And so we're really focused on, on citations as our name suggests um, and trying to bring in the next generation of citations. So instead of just saying this paper has 100 citations, we want you to be able to say it has 100 citations, four of them have supported it, one has contrasted it, the others have mentioned it in the men uh, method section, things like this. So providing more nuance to allow people to better interpret and understand uh, studies. And so before I like to kind of start all these things, I like to really remind everyone that, you know, scientific publishing can get, it can be onerous, it can be time consuming, it can be challenging. It's, it's you know, not always the, the most fun process of submitting, going through peer review, the costs are exorbitant at this point. Um, but behind it, you know, I, I think it's, uh, it's really amazing. So scientific publications, you know, communicate new findings to the world. And those new findings uh, range from uh, the internet, vaccines, life-saving vaccines, which is, is really funny because I was giving this talk before COVID-19 and still had this slide. And so, you know, through this, this time, uh, we've, we've come a long way. Uh, telescopes, policy, government, all this stuff is informed by research. And, and not only uh, is that research informing our day-to-day -day lives, but it informs future generations. And so that's, that's another kind of amazing aspect of, of scientific publishing that I like to remind us on, because I think we get bogged down sometimes in the details. At the same time, uh, there's a challenge with that. So there is a, a lot of content coming out in biomedical literature alone. There's about two papers per minute. Uh, in all of publishing, this is about four papers per minute. Um, and so it's a massive amount of information to stay up to date with and to understand and to read um, in, in addition to doing that uh, alongside other things uh, like actually doing the work, uh, teaching or administration. Um, and then at the same time, it's, it's also, you know, potentially not as reliable as we would hope. Uh, and so there's been studies from large pharma and nonprofit consortia looking at major studies in these fields and then trying to reproduce them. Um, and then uh, more often than not being unable to. And so this reproducibility is, is a problem because you know, if it's in nature, but someone else can't come to the conclusion, whether that's a big lab, a company or whatnot, perhaps the findings are not robust enough um, and perhaps they're not real. Uh, and so this is one thing that we're, we're or, or these are two things that we're really trying to help uh, improve upon, or if not solve at site is to, to make it easier to understand uh, scientific research um, and then to make it more reliable. Uh, and we wanna do that by basically surfacing this information that's out there, but making it easier to digest uh, and utilize. And so we've done that by focusing on Joshua, citations. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, may I ask you something in this point? Uh, of course. You, you mentioned uh, reproducibility crisis is very important and then uh, your uh, product uh, will be a solution for this uh, problem. So I really wonder how you are going to solve this problem without research data. I, I wouldn't say we're going to solve all of it. I think mm -hmm. it's a complex problem and there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, you know, it's multifactorial leading to this. And so mm -hmm. the incentive structure in, in science is to get into these highly selective journals, to get into these highly selective journals, you need a flashy result, a surprising result. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this leads to incentivizes people to cut corners. And I don't think it's outright malicious fraud that is the problem here, but I think it's, you know, these cutting of corners or leaving that experiment out 
or you know kind of introducing bias this way just because it's so competitive to get funding to get into journals uh, that that ultimately leads to this at scale um, and i'll give you a personal example actually where this happened sure. and so during my phd uh, i was looking at chromosome segregation defects and basically what we did was put an extra chromosome into cells and and we're looking at does this cause uh, more missegregation defects and what we found was in these four cell lines, it increases the rate of chromosome segregation defects. In this other cell line, it didn't show that. And this other cell line, it didn't refute what the other one showed. It just showed that it wasn't this hard rule that if you add chromosomes, uh, that you're going to see this increase in chromosome segregation. And so I wrote this up as a student. Um, and when I presented it to my PI and, and you know, my, my committee, they said, oh, no, leave that out because we need to get this past peer review. And so I think this, you know, is, is I don't see as fraud, but I see as a bad behavior. And I think it happens at scale where we are, you know, leaving out the experiments that didn't work uh, or the negative studies, if you will. Um, yeah. And maybe we're even doing some things with our statistics. We're like, OK, let's look at this one tail versus two tail. And that is because you are rewarded, you know, not necessarily for, for being right, but for getting it in this journal um, at, at kind of all costs. Uh, I'm trying to admit this person. And so I think, you know, one thing that we want to do with that is, is basically to try to say it's not about impact at all costs. It's really mm -hmm. about, you know, can you improve, uh, can, can others validate what you've come to, to see? And so that was initially the idea behind site is trying to to introduce this metric around reproducibility, I would say it's shifted uh, a bit since then. And it's not just reproducibility. It's more so, you know, can we surface this expert analyses and, and, and data that's out there to help people better understand uh, and utilize this research? I don't know if that's a question or if it's just background. Um, and so so how, do, how does site work? So, Speaking of my research, the way that I like to kind of show sight is to show the world as it exists without sight, uh, and then to show it through the lens of sight. And so this is uh, what I was just referring to. This is the study where we are looking at chromosome segregation defects in cancer cells and non-cancer cells um, to see does aneuploidy increase the rate of chromosome missegregation. Uh, this work was ultimately published in eLife. As I mentioned, I did my PhD at Virginia Tech. We collaborated with the hospital in Portugal. Uh, as well as a lab in the NIH. Uh, it's been cited 49 times and then viewed uh, just over 11,000 times. And so this is what we all look at when we uh, first look at a scientific publication. Which journal is it in? Is it in a fancy journal? Uh, do, is it in Cell, Nature Science? Is it a journal that I know? Uh, what are the affiliations? Are they from Harvard or MIT? Things like this. Um, and then the, some metrics. How many times has it been viewed? Uh, cited, downloaded, and then increasingly alt metrics as well. And I would say in most cases, people are not really digging into this number. They're just utilizing it as a superficial number. So high is good, low is not so good. Um, and that makes sense because if you want to see what these 49 studies or reviews say about my work, you have to open all of them. Uh, and I've started to kind of like test this and see, you know, how quickly would that be, say, if I wanted to open up 49 different studies? Um, and in some cases, you'll run into a wall like this where you don't have access. So I don't have access to Scopus. So I'd have to basically copy and paste these titles, search them and see if I can access it, then open the, the article, find where they mention my work in the article and then read it. And I think at the quickest, when you have access and you can do this through Google Scholar, it's about a minute per, per article. And so if you expand that to, you know, say 50 or 60 citations, that's about an hour just to look at how one article has been cited. And that is, I would say, at the quickest end. It's probably multiple, really you know, more like multiple hours. And so people are not doing this, right? You're not opening 49 different studies, finding the in-text citation, reading it to say, what does the literature say about this article that I'm interested in? And that, to me, is a missed opportunity because within those citing studies could be very valuable information. By definition, they're citing it, they're, they're related. Uh, maybe that work uh, found something similar to what I found. Maybe they provide you know, more detailed analyses. Maybe they've looked in different cell lines or different systems. You don't know until you open that. And so we want to kind of change that by, by making this number easy to digest, by showing the citation context, 
um, and then organizing it by various different ways. And so we have this browser extension for Chrome, which I think is one of the best ways to, to you know, passively and kind of easily use site because it will follow you anywhere you're reading the scientific literature online. So you can continue to use PubMed if you're using PubMed and it shows up there. You can just come to articles like eLife itself. So this only shows if you have the browser extension, it will show in reference sections, it will do this uh, on, on uh, Elsevier articles, Springer Nature articles. It'll work partially in Google Scholar um, and then also in Web of Science and Scopus and really kind of anywhere a DOI is linked. Uh, and this will provide you with our information next to this article that you maybe are interested in. And what you can do with it is not just say, okay, green must be good, but you can click it uh, and it will bring you over to site. And what you'll see, uh, different from other citation indices where they just show titles like this, uh, is that you'll see the citation context. And so this excerpt of text comes from this full text of this citing article that was published three years after mine in Molecular Biology of the Cell. And so it's very easy to see what does this article say about this article? You can just read it. So it says, in agreement with previous work and then cites Nicholson et al, 2015, the trisoma clone showed similar aberrations, albeit to a lesser extent, supplemental figure S2B. And so really with you know, one kind of click uh, and, and much like basically five seconds, we're able to read what a citing article says and able to see that they are providing uh, supporting evidence. So they're saying in agreement and then they're indicating that here's the supporting evidence. And so to me, this is quite powerful way of, of you know, better understanding the literature, interpreting results and, and seeing, is this something that I should trust or, or not? Um, in addition to just you know, looking for supporting or contrasting citation statements, you can also uh, search these snippets. So say I want to search, I'm not interested in just supporting or contrasting, but I, I'm interested in yeast in chromosome segregation. You can search for that here. Uh, you can see the blue is, is uh, always the target citation. So the citation to my work, maybe you wanna see what are these other three studies that are, someone is citing that's also with my work. Maybe these are, are other studies that I'm unaware of. And so here is one that's looking at, again, chromosome misaggregation in budding yeast. If you come back and select 11, you can see here, again, this is just like the finding that I found the presence of extra chromosomes leads to genomic instability. And so this is a powerful way to not only kind of quickly see how a scientific paper has been studied, but then to kind of find some related work um, and then search for whatever, you know, you might be interested in. Um, and personally, you know, there's, there's certain things that, that people will ask in my family about this treatment for, for, for this or that. Uh, and I'll come to the literature and I'm not an expert, but, but I can easily kind of now search and see what do experts and what does data say behind these things. And that relates to uh, not just chromosome segregation defects, but really kind of everything because scientific publications or research publications relate to everything. And so this is, I would say the main kind of value add of site is that you can see the citation context. You can see where that citation context comes from. So this appears in the results section from this article. You can see who the citing authors are. If they're a self site, we'll flag that. And then we provide this deep learning model that classifies the citation statement as supporting, uh, contrasting, or, or mentioning. We have other filters, though, that I think are also equally as important. So say you want to see you know, recent publications, you can slide this over, and this will limit uh, to, to more recent articles, so 2020. Um, if you are the author of this, you can set up email alerts. So this will send you an email if you turn on that alert when there is a new citation to your work. Um, and so this is a powerful way to you know, see how others are citing your work and stay on top of that without having to come and search uh, all this every time. Uh, you, Josh, Josh uh, may I ask something? Uh, please. Uh, what is the main uh, differences uh, between uh, mentioning and supporting? Yeah, so, so mentioning is, is kind of our default. It's kind of neutral. And it, what do you mean? Ne 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 so, to be, so, so to be honest, mentioning could be a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. Mentioning could be, you know, we could classify mentioning further into different types. What mm -hmm. we're looking for uh, with our deep learning model is does this citation statement, so does the sentence where this is uh, linked, 
does it provide, does it indicate that they're supporting the citation and that there's supporting evidence? And so the way that we've trained this model was to basically look at text like this, unlabeled without anything, read it as experts. So as, as PhDs or MDs on the team uh, and say, okay, they're saying in agreement with previous work. So they're supporting Nicholson, right? They're agreeing with it. And then they're saying the trisoma clone shows similar aberrations, albeit to a lesser extent. So they're supporting it, but then they're also indicating that they're supporting it with evidence. And so we would classify that as supporting. And what we've done is basically to read roughly 50,000 of these citation statements as humans uh, manually, quite laboriously. And it took over, you know, basically about two years to do this. Um, read this as humans and say, okay, these authors are indicating that they provide supporting evidence or that they provide contrasting evidence. And if it's neither of those, it's just going to be called mentioning. Um, and so that is, you know, how we've trained this deep learning model so that we can classify these citation statements as scale uh, because 50,000, while it's a lot, is not, you know, 800 and, and uh, where are we at today? It, it's, it's not 881 million citation statements. And so this is necessary, I think, to have this machine go over, you know, millions of articles and millions of citation statements because without a machine, it's virtually impossible unless you employed kind of the entire world to do it. Um, as, far, as far as I understand, the, for the future, uh, new classification will come for the mentioning. I, I, I think so. There's more possibility, yes. So, mentioning yeah. could be yeah. certain other things. And I think we yeah. want to be very careful about what we introduce and when we yeah. introduce it yeah. because we don't want to add too much confusion. Um, and, and also, you know, we want to be careful about classifying these citation types. So we think it's it's easier to say this paper has been supported by experimental evidence than it is to say this paper has been supported by opinion. Um, and so we're not just looking at positive or negative sentiment. And I think sometimes there can be some confusion around that because people say, oh, they're, they're citing this paper in a nice way. And they'll say, yes, they are citing this paper in a nice way, but they're not indicating that they actually support it. And I think that's a different level of evidence um, and, and right now we'd rather have the bar be higher saying, okay, if this is going to be a supporting citation statement, it's because they present supporting evidence or analysis or data. Um, but mentioning could certainly be other things. And another thing, which I think we can also kind of like, you know, these are not classified as citation types, but you could say, you know, this is, these are discussion citation types, right? They all appear in the discussion. They're all discussing the work. Um, and so you don't need necessarily deep learning model to say, here's a citation type where they're discussing the work. Here's a citation type where they are potentially utilizing the methods um, and things like this. And so I think these paper sections is one thing we want to kind of emphasize a bit more because I think it's really powerful. Again, you know, these, these are powerful citation types to, to quickly look at that, but so are these. Say you're a student um, or you're new to this field and you want to see how have, how have experts, you know, people that are citing this work that have past peer review, how are they referring to this? Um, and I think that's one thing that we've really kind of uh, come to understand uh, is, is a big use, especially by students, is this is a way to see, you know, how do experts understand this study that I need to understand, that I need to interpret. Um, and so looking at the discussion citation type, if you will, would be a powerful way to do that. Uh, um, if I uh, if I would if I have if I would like to have any score for any article, mm -hmm. is it easy to calculate uh, if any citation coming from the intro, coming from the discussion, this article good or this article bad, this article valuable more than this? Yeah, so we kind of limited. So initially, the idea was to have a single score around a publication, yeah. and we called yeah, this yeah. the R factor. And when we started to go out and give talks to researchers, I mean, there was there was pretty strong pushback because I think researchers yeah. they don't want to be judged by this individual number, right? Like mm -hmm. what they currently are today, right? Highly cited. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've kind of dropped that for individual, or we have dropped that for individual articles and researchers. It exists still for journals where, you know, we think it's, it's kind of necessary to, to add some complement to the impact factor. But really, you know, you can also kind of just look at this yourself and say, you know, this paper has 62 mentioning citations, 
three supporting, it's been cited by 60 papers, and you can come to your own conclusion. And I think what is important though, is that you know, not all supporting citations are equal either, right? In one case, they can say, we reproduced every detail of this study, Nicholson et al. And in another case, they could say, we found part of this work to be true. And so I think that's important because we show not only you know, just paper to paper citations, but we show multiple citations uh, where they've, uh, you know, in this case, they've just mentioned my work and in this case, they've supported it. Um, and so that nuance is important. And I, I think we don't wanna kind of lose that nuance by just showing an individual number and saying, this person's good, this person's bad because I don't think it's that, that simple. Um, and in some cases, you know, really, sometimes when I see a, a contrasting citation, it's just one. And then I will change, uh, like I, it'll have 20 supporting citation statements, but one contrasting, if I read it and it looks strong enough and it sounds like they've really tested this, it will change my interpretation of that study. And I, I think it's hard to kind of expand that to a rule and say, you know, this ratio means it's good, this ratio means it, it's mm -hmm. bad. Um, and so we really want to encourage people to actually read these things as opposed to just looking at these numbers. Um, and we think we do that by, by making it uh, pretty easy. Um, one thing I should say, though, is, you know, this deep learning model, while, while it's classifying this one correctly and that's pretty easy to see, it's not always the case, right? It's very hard to, to have a machine interpret what a scientific uh, statement has said and to say, does this provide supporting or contrasting evidence? Um, and, you know, we are, are kind of one of the first ones to do this, but people have been suggesting this for, for years, even back to the 60s. And so it's not perfect and it will never be perfect. And I think it's important to kind of understand that. And that also relates to the fact of like, you know, we don't want people to be judged by this individual number because it's not perfect. And so next to each citation statement is this link that says flag misclassified site. And so what you can do is if you read this and you're saying, okay, this doesn't look like it's supporting or this doesn't look like it's mentioning, you can provide feedback to the system and say, this site should actually be mentioning. And you can say, this should be mentioning uh, because, and then introduce some other quote. And then this will be reviewed by us basically you know, within a day and accepted or rejected. And that's important because that provides feedback for users uh, to have this kind of hybrid system of human as well as machine looking at these citation statements. Um, and I think we will expand that. That'll allow authors to provide even more nuance on these things. Um, and so that's really kind of like where we're going is trying to provide more nuance uh, as opposed to just providing more numbers uh, so that you can better understand the, the literature. Um, so continuing, uh, you know, down here, uh, I was highlighting the fact that you can organize by where the citations appear, and that's pretty powerful. And I think, you know, generally uh, supporting the contrasting and a lot of interesting statements come from these two regions, uh, because that's when they're, they're qualifying it in terms of their results, or they're discussing in, the, in light of their results. Uh, but you can also start to break this down by article types. And so articles are, are traditional peer-reviewed articles. We are regularly ingesting preprints now from BioArchive, MedArchive, uh, Archive, uh, Research Square, places like this. Um, and this is important because preprints are now gaining a lot of popularity. Um, and it's important to stay on top of the literature there and also important to see how preprints themselves have been cited. Um, and then of course, uh, it's, it's important to kind of understand, okay, is this a supporting site from the same lab or is it a, a supporting site from a, a different lab? And so we flag citations as, as self-citations if they share an author uh, or independent if they don't. And one thing that I can say, which I, I, I think is you know, uh, quite powerful is if I see uh, a, a study that has been contrasted, but it's been contrasted by the same group, I almost start to trust that group more because they're not just putting up this study and saying it's the best study in the world, you know, it's great, blah, blah, blah they're really trying to come to this conclusion. So they're even citing their work and showing differences against this. And I think that to me uh, is where you can have a contrasting site and it will lead to more trust in this research or this research group. Uh, and so I think that's very powerful. Um, and so this is the, the core of site is showing how citations or how scientific papers have been cited. Uh, and then everything is kind of built around that. And so I'm gonna walk through a few other things uh, to just to say, to, to show how we can you know, help not just looking at individual article, but looking at groups of articles, looking at articles that are unpublished, 
um, and, and staying on top of things like that. And so down here, uh, we have the ability to visualize reports. And so this will be just a visual representation of what you just saw. Uh, one key difference here, though, is that we're showing, you know, both directions. So we're showing citations coming from my paper, as well as showing citations to my paper. And so here's an arrow, there's my paper. Uh, here is a citation from me to Gao uh, in 2007. Uh, and you can click here and see basically what did I write? And it says these findings support previous studies showing that aneuploidy directly affects transcript and protein levels in various systems. Um, and so I am supporting that work and you can see that by the color. It was a green edge. And so these are all supporting citation statements, the blue or contrasting citation statements where you can look at these things uh, and see uh, that there, there's differences. And so this one, you know, is, I don't wanna read everyone, but it says at the end, we think that the two phenotypes we observe in our study are independent of each other. And so it's, it's talking about where these are linked and then we're saying we think they're independent. Um, and then if you wanna see all sites, you can expand that. Uh, and the size of this node will relate to how many citations this paper has received. Um, and you can even start to expand these things to look at multiple papers. And so this is a, a visual representation of citation networks. Um, and I think this is our first step. There's a lot more that we can do with these so that you can better understand the field of work. Uh, the red ones, uh, just while I'm showing you, will indicate that there's either a retraction uh, or that there's a, a correction or something like this. Um, and so this is, uh, again, kind of a, a, an interesting way of looking at citation networks and, and kind of looking at a field in general. And I think it's most powerful uh, if you don't show mentioning sites because then it becomes easier to digest. And you can see without a mentioning site, you know, there's no links between these two things. And so that is uh, something that, that we're expanding to not just look at individual articles, but to start to allow authors to look at their own network. So their citation network from, from work that they've done, and then to start to look at groups of articles. Um, and so I think these groups of articles uh, is, is something that is uh, also very valuable and, and that we found uh, uh, large companies to, to really find interest and value in but also individuals. And so I'm gonna walk everyone through now how you can use Cite to, to best look at groups of articles, say you're new to a topic area and you want to understand it, um, and then to, to set up alerts to stay on top of this. So if we search uh, chromosome misegregation here, uh, you can see that we identify 533 articles where chromosome misegregation is mentioned in the title or the abstract. And so we're not doing full text search here, mostly just because it's really expensive and we're a small team. Uh, over time, I think we can do a full text search and I think that'll be even more powerful. But right now it's just looking at, you know, here are articles where chromosome misegregation is mentioned um, in the title or, or the, the abstract. Uh, you can limit these things and say, I'm interested in chromosome misegregation and I'm interested in articles that were published in 2010 afterwards. And you'll see this are now 2018, 2011, 2013, and that narrowed the result. You can order these things and say, I wanna see the most supported article from 2010 where chromosome misegregations mentioned. And what you'll see here is that this paper in Nature has 1800 uh, citations, paper citations, uh, 92 supporting citations, 2200 mentioning citations. So again, a paper can cite a, another paper multiple times. Uh, and then six contrasting. Um, and so this is a powerful way to kind of look at topics and diseases or, or whatever you're interested in and quickly understand that. And then over here, there's a lot of control that you can apply to this. So you can filter by year, you can filter by journal, uh, you can filter by author type, things like this. One thing that is new uh, since we last spoke and since I last showed site is that we now show authors. So if you want to search a topic and see which author has the most articles that match this criteria, you can do this here. Um, and, and going back to, you know, let's remove this. Uh, this is my PhD advisor. So if you search chromosome misegregation and say, I wanna see the, uh, the researcher that has the most articles mentioning chromosome segregation, uh, you'll see that Daniela Chimina, who is my uh, PhD advisor, she has uh, the, the most articles there. Um, and so this is a powerful way to not only understand the literature better, but to better identify you know, leaders uh, within the field and leaders however you define it. So you can choose, you know, I want to say chromosome misegregation. I want to see only publications that have at least one supporting site. Uh, and you'll see this narrows the results. 
and it'll narrow the publications here. Daniela Cimini, Angelica Amont, these are all, you know, leaders kind of in the field. Um, and you can say, okay, maybe one supporting site and no contrasting sites. And so this further narrows it and it'll change these things. And so you really have a lot of control at looking at different topics and saying, okay, this is what I'm interested in. Um, and I want to better understand these areas, better understand the researchers. Um, and I want to basically be alerted when there's a new article matching this, this criteria that I've set or a new citation. And so we have this ability to save your search results, um, which is, okay, I want to enable email alerts for when there's new citations to any of these 192 publications, or there's new publications matching this criteria. And that is a powerful way to, I think, understand a field and to stay on top of a field. Um, and I think there's, there's more things that we can do there. Uh, in addition to this, uh, and let me just take this off, uh, we also have the ability to look at this information, this citation information uh, in aggregate. Uh, and so here, well, let's let this go, it's a little slow. So here again is chromosome misaggregation. Uh, it's filtered by articles where there's at least one supporting citation statement um, and then there's no other restrictions. So say I wanna see this information in aggregate and maybe I wanna compare two different groups. Uh, what you can do is create a custom dashboard. And here you can also save the search query and you can also turn on email alerts if you want. I'm gonna turn them off um, and you can hit save. And basically what we're doing here is creating this report that is gonna group these 257 publications uh, together and then show you the total aggregate information. So how many articles there are, how many citations there are, are there any retractions, are there any corrections? Uh, and, and you can also see some of that here. Um, and then you can also filter within that. And this is, uh, there we go, a little slow. So here is this dashboard that I made, chromosome segregation. You can change the title if you want, you can delete the dashboard. It shows the articles, it shows the total breakdown of citations at this, this uh, group level, the number of editorial notices, and then something we call the site index. And so this will show, you know, generally, are there more supporting or less supporting citations over time? Um, and you can show this within these two-year windows, five-year windows, or a lifetime. Uh, and so this will be, you know, basically looking at different uh, time windows uh, over, over the, the course of the last, you know, basically almost 20 years to see, is this field, you know, receiving more support or less? Um, and maybe you can use this to also compare two different fields. Um, and I think it's just a better way to kind of look at this stuff in aggregate. And then if you scroll down, you can also see, okay, here is the most supported article in that group. Uh, and you can filter on these things. Here's the most supported article in that group where there's no contrasting sites, uh, changes this. Um, and we've just added this to show, again, not just the citation statements, but also the publications. Um, and I think that's important because one thing that we've done recently is to not just show citation statements, uh, but is to also show traditional citations. And so to do what we do, we need access to full text um, and, and not everything in the world is open and, and free to just analyze. And so we've worked with uh, about a dozen different publishers to gain access to this content, but there's still cases, uh, articles, millions of articles where we don't have access. And so in that case, we just show a traditional citation and this comes from uh, uh, Crossref's open citations uh, that has really good coverage now because Elsevier is now actually depositing their, their references. And so we have this comprehensive solution looking at traditional citations, so kind of what most citations are showing. Uh, and then we have more citation statements than anyone in the world. Uh, so you can see how something has been cited. And so we've just started to surface that here. So you can look at, okay, maybe I'm interested in citing publications or maybe site doesn't have good coverage in this area. I can still see this information. And again, this is a very useful way, I think, for understanding kind of a field uh, or a new topic, uh, whether you're a student or you're an expert. Uh, and so we see this by students, you know, coming to, to do dissertation work, but we also see this by large pharma companies that are interested in tracking uh, research related to this drug uh, and whatnot. And I think, you know, there's more room to do other things here to better allow you to, to understand this field. And so I could see us adding visualizations to visualize these 257 articles, adding author information here to see, okay, who are the top authors uh, in, in this field, uh, so on and so forth. 
um, and we'll continually, you know, improve that. And, and we would love feedback on, on basically all aspects of the site uh, if you have any questions or, or kind of feedback there. Um, so that's a way to create a custom dashboard based on your interest. Say you're interested in looking at uh, a journal. So we have this ability to look at aggregate information at the journal level, um, and you can filter these things here. So say I want to see which, which journal has the most citations according to site. So the most uh, is PNAS, then Nature, then Science. Um, and you can also filter by which one has the most uh, supporting citations, which might also be PNAS. Uh, you can look at the, the site index. So again, this is looking at the ratio. And so let's look at the one with the most uh, with the highest site index in two years. So this is math. Uh, and what I can tell you is math and physics have a lot of supporting citation statements, which I think you know, makes sense with our tool and also reflects very well our, our, our different disciplines. Um, and what you can do is, uh, is, is you, know, you can simply open these things. Uh, and so again, this will show the same information, total number of articles, citation types, editorial notices. You can set alerts if you want. Um, and then you can see the site index and how things are changing. And you can better understand these journals and be like, oh, is this a journal that I should submit to? Is this a journal that I, I, I trust? Um, uh, it really just to kind of give this extra information beyond just the impact factor uh, to, to anyone that's kind of interested in. Another thing that we've recently added, and this is still a little bit of a work in progress because we're still adding data to this, um, is, is university uh, dashboards. Uh, and so you can, again, you know, filter by all these things. You can look at any university that you're interested in. So let's look at uh, Virginia Tech where I did my PhD. And you can open these things and sometimes they're a little slow to initially open and see this information at the university level. Uh, and so this is, uh, again, still populating with data but it still has a lot of data uh, right now. And it'll show, here's the total number of articles that we could identify that came from this university Here's a breakdown of these. Here's editorial notices. Uh, here's uh, you know what the citation uh, record looks like over time. And then once this loads, you'll be able to again quickly identify like what is the most supported article from this. Um, and I think that is useful and interesting for a lot of different use cases. Uh, and this could be you know a way to kind of find if you're a student, a lab that maybe I want to join. I want to check this work of this researcher. Uh, if you're at a library, understanding the, the research coming out of your organization, or if you're an administrator as well. Um, and that's new uh, and something that we found universities to, to really like. We also have this at the funder level. Um, and I'll just, you know, I, I don't need to keep walking through it because it's all basically the same thing. But the funder level will say, uh, you know, if there's a national institute in, in Turkey, or if, if uh, you want to look at how private companies have funded, you can search these here. Uh, and, and see that information as, as well. And so really what we're doing is, you know, we have this new way, this new type of citation, we're applying it to the article, we're applying it to journals, we're applying it to topics and fields. We're really applying it to everywhere citations exist today already. And we're, we're trying to take it, you know, one step further. Um, a few other things. So we have the ability to kind of create a custom dashboard from our search as I showed. Uh, but you can also import your reference manager, Zotero or Mendeley. Um, we also have a plugin for Zotero, which will show this information directly within Zotero. So here is our, that information within Zotero. Um, and so you can check before you add this reference while you're going to cite, maybe you want to see what does that one uh, say. And so this will be, you know, view site report and we'll, that will take you to site and you can quickly see these things. Um, so that's useful for individuals um, or, or for groups that are, are writing a paper. Uh, and then we have this reference check, which actually has a bug this morning, so I'm not gonna show it, but basically what the reference check uh, does is allows you to upload a PDF or, or a Word document. We will automatically identify the in-text citations uh, and then tell you, you know, reference one that you're using has been contrasted or it's been retracted uh, or reference three, things like this. Um, and again, this is, you know, I just ran into a bug this morning with it. So we're going to fix that, but, but that should be back today. And so I'm going to stop there because I think, you know, I'd love to hear questions and, and uh, feedback and, and answer anything that you guys might have. Um, and I would say thanks everyone for, for listening and, and uh, walking through all of this with me. I think you should. It's really, really, really nice, really nice. Thank you. Thank you very much.
think if you have a question, you can just unmute yourself probably and ask it. Tukonoja. So uh, I asked my questions last time. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I invited my PhD students. So uh, we really enjoyed your, your presentation. Thank you. Uh, hopefully, we are going to go deep uh, in computer science because your examples are from more like medical field. Yeah. So uh, I really want to experience how it goes with computer science, but we'll let you know. Yeah, so, so I can tell you a, a little. It's better in biomedical than computer science, and that's mostly yeah. a reflection of access. So uh -huh. we, we don't have an agreement with IEEE, for example. And so we don't have full text of IEEE articles um, or ACM articles and things oh, like this. Okay. <laughs> and so those are, that's, those are big limitations. We do have traditional citations and so you'll see that, but you know, that's what other citation tools have as well. And so yeah. this is you know, a long-term goal of ours is to be able to analyze every publication. But obviously, you know, these groups are, are used to selling this content for a lot of money. And so it's, it's, we'll take some time, but I think, you know, we've made good progress and we'll continue to make good progress. Uh, and as we sign indexing agreements with new publishers, it always helps with other publishers. And so we have a few coming up uh, with, with, this is psychology, APA, uh, also AAAS. And then we've been talking to Springer Nature for quite some time, which would also help with computer science. Um, and so there are certain limitations. Um, and I think, you know, computer science is one where obviously a lot of members of the team have computer science backgrounds. Yes. Uh, and so it's one that we try very hard to get uh, okay. and one that we'll continue to kind of push for to get. Uh, it's just, you know, it, it takes some time to set some of those relationships up. But thanks. And, and yeah, thank you. Do yes. test it. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Another thing I can say is once you're logged in, you know, this is what your kind of hub will look like. So you can see your bio, you can, uh, 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 one thing that we're doing actually right now, which I think will be quite cool is right now this shows, okay, here's how many articles I have. Here's how many citations I have. It doesn't show how I've cited other people. And so we have that information and we're gonna show not only how have I have been cited, but how do I cite others? Um, and I think that'll be really interesting to say, you know, for authors to look at, this is one paper you've cited a lot. This is one paper you've contrasted. Yes. And I think it'll give this extra information that you really kind of can't get anywhere else. And you could also say like, you know, I cite uh, more open access articles than closed articles, kind of all this information we're starting to surface to, to allow authors to not just look at, you know, how others have cited them, but, but allow them to kind of look at themselves and say, how do I cite others? Um, and then to make sure it's, you know, actually correct. And so that's one thing that we're working on uh, we just started on yesterday, um, and we'll, well, if you have feedback on different things that you'd want to see, please let me know, uh, and, and I think we can start to surface that. But you can look at your profile. You can sh have a public profile. You can sync your articles from ORCID. This is the public profile. Here's where all my dashboards are that I've, I've created. You can uh, open those and save them. Reference checks as well. Save searches, uh, and you can turn off the alerts here. Uh, alerts also, it will show the different alerts that I have. So I, I do get a lot of emails now because I've set up some. Um, if you have any, you know, if you want to kind of go through some of these things again without me, obviously we're recording this, we'll make that available, but there's also some guides here. So here's how to set up topic notifications. Here's how to create dashboards. Here's how to use our reference check. And here's kind of how to use reports. Um, and then you can invite colleagues and, and, and things like this. Um, and so, yeah, we'll continue to improve. And, and definitely, if you have any questions or feedback, feel free to email us uh, directly. And, and you know, we, we listen to that. Or we even have a little help bubble. And you can say, hey, this is not working, or this is unclear. And then we generally answer uh, pretty quickly if it's, if it's normal business hours for us. How many researchers be inside of the uh, site? How many researchers have signed up on site? Or? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it's today is about I think thirty-two thousand, um, and so it's growing rapidly. 
Uh, a lot of it is students recently, which is surprising. We've done quite well on TikTok, which I was not expecting at all. But there's a lot of students in the UK, especially, which is, again, we have more users in the UK than, than in the US. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because a lot of students are using it. And I think it makes sense because students, they're not experts in their field, uh, but they're often tasked with looking at this research, interpreting it, writing an essay about it, and Sight can help a lot with that. Um, we are, you know, starting to grow though. And, and I think one thing that will allow that is we now show our information uh, directly on the version of record on, on a lot of publications. And so we're live on a hundred plus journals on Wiley. And so if you look at Wiley and one of the journals uh, is displaying our information, uh, you'll be able to see that. And so here is, here, let's look at this one, artificial intelligence and machine learning in spine research. So I think this is one of their highly cited ones. And you can see this is what they've traditionally shown. They're now showing this information. Um, and so that is drawing a lot more people to the tool and they're, they're starting to learn. Um, and again, like this is starting to show up in different areas. Uh, this is at, at university repositories like this. Uh, you can see this information. Oops, no, that's not the one I wanna look at. Uh, you can see our information embedded there alongside other citation tools. Um, and we've just added the citing publication. And that is our strategy is really to kind of stay focused on what we do, which is challenging enough in itself, and to enhance all these other tools and services and workflows that already exist by uh, displaying that information. And we make that available via our badge, which can be added for free and pretty easily. Um, and it can be customized. So this could be added in the university repository or search system, and you can choose to show it horizontally. You can choose to show it when there's no citations. By default, it hides. You can add type labels, things like this, and then it's just this little snippet of text. Um, and so that is uh, kind of how we, we, we think will grow is by getting this information out there, not requiring everyone to come to site and learn about us, but starting to get this information out there in different systems and tools and services. Um, and we've done a lot of partnering with with other tools and groups now to to add that, um, and it's it's pretty exciting because I think you know we're on a hundred plus journals on on Wiley, which is hundreds of thousands of of articles, which uh, you know I I think takes us from kind of this interesting startup on the side doing something to really taking the next step to like okay here's how citations are going to go, whether that's us or someone else, you know I think inevitably citations will look something like what we're doing. Uh, just because they provide so much more information than what we're, we're tr actually showing now. Oh, nice. Also, you are, you're planning to add uh, this batch to our uh, institutional repository. So I'm you guys, my yeah, 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 you guys would add this. Um, mm -hmm. we're, we're certainly glad to help. We also have an API that researchers can use for bibliometric analyses. I think there's a lot of fascinating things that could be done here. Uh, you could look at, you know, does data availability statements lead to more supporting citations, things like this. Um, you know, there's there's interesting studies that could be looked at uh, around gender. Do to male or female receive more supporting citations? Basically, all these things that we've done with traditional citations could now be looked at through this new light. Um, and obviously, we can't do all of that ourselves. Um, so. We're, we're, we're happy to make this API available for research purposes as well as other purposes. Um, and we're starting to see more of these studies come to light. And I think that's really exciting. Uh, okay. One thing is that we've also written a preprint, which uh, has received some positive reviews. So hopefully it'll be published soon, uh, detailing, you know, how, how have we built site? Um, how, how can this be useful? And so I think that's important to kind of better understand the system, the limitations, understanding the context of other research. Um, and, and that's available at, at BioArchive and, and hopefully will be available uh, once it's accepted by this journal uh, soon. Mm -hmm. Okay, if there's nothing else, yeah, I mean, I would continue to encourage you guys just to, to email us if thoughts come or, or questions uh, or to write through the little help bubble and we generally answer pretty quick. Uh, and then to test the tool and use it. Uh, so it's not just looking at individual articles. You can test these dashboards. Uh, reference check is down right now, but that should be uh, fixed. Maybe maybe it's fixed already. I'd have to look at Slack. Um, to try out all these different things and, and uh, 
yeah, love to work kind of with you guys more as opposed to like, here's a service, just use it uh, type of, of relationship. Okay. Okay. I will stop sharing the screen. And yeah, thanks everyone so much for joining and, and thanks uh, for, for organizing this as well. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Josh. Thank you very much. Okay.